Welcome along, everybody, to this new and extremely exciting episode of Irreverent with me, the Reverend Jamie Franklin. And as always, you might not even recognize him this week, but we have with us the very, well, he's not the very reverend. I was going to call him that. That would be a technical error. He is a reverend and he is very reverend, but not in that technical sense. It is Thomas Pelham. Tom, how are you doing? Uh, I'm very well, thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, don't wish uh, the very reverend on me, please. Uh, I've no <laughs> well, I would, no, I, I would wish that on you, Tom. I would, would you? wish that oh, on oh, you dear. because we need, um, we need people like you in places of high influence, especially well, with, that, with that clean-shaven jaw you have. Well, do you know, Jamie, every now and again, every few years, it's nice to check you still have a chin. Yes. Um, and uh, so, I, so that's, that's what I did. I went and had a, a Turkish shave. It was um, very disappointing, actually. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, but no, it was, just wasn't very good. I mean, I've, I've, I've had better ones. Um, there's something nice about them. Uh, a sort of cut so what was, what was wrong with this, Tom? Why I was do, it do you know what? I, were you abused I think, while you were there? Were you, were you insulted? No, I, do you know what? The main thing I didn't like was um, the... Uh, the, the normally you have like they make up the the, the shaving foam and the sort of bristle it on you know put it on you and uh, that's a kind of ritual around that and they sharpen up the um the uh the uh the, the razor and that sort of thing which is kind of um there's a ritual to it um yeah and i think probably because i went at about six o'clock on the first day that they were open after three months uh, he was having none of that yeah and he just sort of did it um with no fuss Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to that. be fair to the chap, um, he hadn't he had been working since nine o'clock in the morning, without a break. So, um, well, what time was it? Six o'clock in the evening. All oh, right. Okay. I suppose yeah. that's so reasonably impressive. Um, I, I was. That reminds me of I, I watched uh, the Hunger Games: Catching Fire Part One um, with the wife last week, and uh, there's a scene in that where where Donald Sutherland is having a, a wet shave. Is it wet yeah. shave or dry shave? I, I wet can't shave, wet shave. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the barber sort of nicks him and there's this moment of tension. I think it's actually an homage to the film The Untouchables where um, Robert De Niro plays, um, what's his name? That gangster. I, it, my, the barber did actually nick me slightly. There wasn't that moment of tension did because you, I'm did not you look the leader at, of a... Did you look at him I didn't, and you were no, about to shoot him? No, I didn't. And I'm, nor am I the leader of uh, a fascist regime. So I don't think there's that sort of sense of palpable danger around my presence, I hope anyway. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so um, can somebody, can you remember that, what, what that gangster is? I can't remember. He's like the most famous gangster in history. Is it Al Capone? Yeah, it's Al Capone. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. What is the matter with me? I think it's a lack of sleep. It's no excuse. Um, we should probably, um, Tom, and one other thing, of course, Tom, is that you have a new microphone, which everyone is extremely excited about. I tweeted this out on Twitter, and honestly, the, the response was, it was fanatical. It was like, it was like Beatlemania, but on, on Twitter. So, Tom, I just, I just want to congratulate you on that purchase, really. Thank you, Jamie. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. You sound, beautiful. You sound amazing. Thank you, but yes. you sound far less like butter. Yeah, like butter. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great description. All right, let's come round to our other uh, co-host before we introduce our extremely special guest, uh, Daniel French, priest of the Sulcombe area, um, journalist, writer, thinker extraordinaire. Daniel, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing fine, actually. Uh, this week we've had a new intern join our intern community, so it's becoming a community proper. Yeah. Um, uh, so we have three in our intern house rather than two. So it's rather nice to see a new dynamic, actually, and spend the morning with them today. And they, they, they invited the vicar around for, for cake and tea, which was very nice. Very nice. Lovely, lovely. Uh, so it's uh, that, yeah. And I'm working away on a piece for the North magazine um, for Clinton. I'm at that stage. You know, at that stage, you get into an essay or an article where... Uh, you've been slogging over it and then suddenly you start getting you get to that point where you start to speed up and yeah. you know you're going to write too much yeah. um, it's a rather nice sort of place to sort of be in so uh, yeah so that's uh, the that's the north american angle yeah i've got a couple yeah. of days i've got a couple of days to to finish that off a few thousand words on um uh and how might the benedict option look like in uh, an Anglican context, uh, you know, I've, no option for the Benedict option. I think is what Clinton. You know, I've actually um, I've been reading. I've never got around to reading 
my, my oh, copy of this. Uh, so, text. so I have actually just started reading it, and I'm finding it really fascinating. Ooh. I knew it was roughly what it said because I'd read a variety of articles by Roger Hare around it, but I'd never actually read the text. But there, there it is, uh, halfway through. Wow. Finally, a bit of time to do it. Um, yeah, well, we, we we await that article with bated breath, Daniel. Yeah. So that's on the North American Anglican Journal, right? Which is yeah. uh, an and, online, and, online journal. And the other thing is that Stalkham at the moment is absolutely ram packed, folks. Really busy. Wow. Um, loads of folks, uh, you know, loads of people in caravans and fields which I've not seen to the degree of that degree before. Beach is really full. Um, yeah. Beautiful sunny day out there. It's the second week of, of half term. Of, of Easter, Easter, Easter holiday. Term. So yeah, it's really, really busy. Yeah, fantastic. That's really great. Well, good to have you, Daniel. Really good to to see you back after a week away. And now, of course, we must introduce our very extra special guest. Uh, this is the first time we've ever had four people on the show, and so to complete our quartet, we have all the way from the U.S. of A. They have now. It is, of course. Esther O'Reilly, who describes herself on her Twitter feed as a Christian humanist, Twitter thought leader, hopeless Anglophile, and young fogey. Esther, thank you so much for coming on the show and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's wonderful to have you. Um, Esther, for, for people um, for whom you're new, could you sort of give a little introduction to who you are and what you're about and what you spend your time doing and so on? Sure. <clears throat> so I'm a, a freelance writer who sort of um, got accidentally semi-famous starting a few years ago when I began blogging about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. Um, and so, I mean, nobody really paid much attention to me uh, before that time. And then I joined the Pathios blog network and had a couple pieces go viral um, and different doors kind of opened from there. So now I've been on uh, unbelievable radio a few times. I, I had a chat with Douglas Murray the other year. Um, I contributed to an essay anthology about Peterson. So, um, and, and since then I've, I've enjoyed the opportunity to write for various outlets like The Spectator and The Critic and Colette and uh, places like that. Yeah. Um, so, but um, actually mainly what I've been doing the past few years is wrapping up my PhD in maths. Yeah. Um, so I finished that this past year, then looking into uh, teaching opportunity that might be coming up later. So, I mean, I really sort of am going to consider that like my, my day job. And somebody was surprised recently when I said that I, um, I'm not like a, I, I don't consider myself a full-time writer, although functionally at the moment, I, I'm sort of relaxing as I, uh, as I transition from end of grad school into the job market. Yeah. But that's kind of a, a snapshot of me at the moment and my, my Twitter bio sort of sums up the different, you know, I, I definitely am a hopeless Anglophile and, and I am a sort of Twitter thought leader of sorts. Somebody called me an influencer recently, so it's wow. like, I don't know anything but that, but hopefully what, it's a good <laughs> What an honor. You're an influencer. That's and, amazing. I <laughs> Capital so in, I, in your right. honor, so I, I'm eating the most British of biscuits, the hobnob, chocolate hobnob. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I thought, oh, the, the, well, I, you know, have you, uh, do they exist in America? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure that we have <clears throat> some kind of lookalike, um, you know, something that, that tastes similar, but doesn't, so isn't the, made up exactly the same way. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, I think American cookies are generally bigger, aren't they? Um, this is quite subtle kind of uh, oaty biscuits. They're, they're I, good. That looks like, I don't know, that looks like a pretty big cookie. I, okay. I don't know. Well, but it's yeah. closer, closer to there you are. If I move it away from the camera, you see it's a huge I'm gonna, cookie. I'm, say no, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. Um, I'm not sure that hobnobs are sort of quintessential. It's a, Brit it's a British English. biscuit. No, it I definitely mean, is. Rich, it's a British biscuit. A rich tea, for example, would be a far more English biscuit than. Honestly, than a hobnobs hobnob. have always I mean, always been made in England. Well, or Britain. Yeah, they have. Come on. Tom, come in, on terms now. Of, in terms of in terms of things which are quintessentially English, I just uh, you know. I think that that's a pretty poor example, if I'm honest with you. No, I don't think so. I, I, well, you, Tom, you, you are the one. You are the one who thought that Chichester was close to Sulcombe. So I guess maybe your maybe your knowledge of your own country is not amazing. I just think it's funny. That you, I just think it's funny. eating it as well. Sorry, what was that, Esther? I'm just intrigued in the way Tom's eating it. You know, it's sort of 
Is it chocolate up or chocolate down? It's chocolate I'm down, a... isn't it? I can see that. It's, and that's <laughs> wrong as well. That's immoral, Tom. That's, that's a violation. That's a violation of nature. Um, if you, if you I... dip that in your tea and you have it upside down, the chocolate is going to run all over your fingers. So there's, Jamie, there's I don't dip it in the tea. I I'm sorry, I'm not a tea dipper. Well, um, that's not English either. <laughs> Funny to wonder if you even are English, Tom. Sorry, I, I'm just over here. I'm just over here laughing that because you call cookies biscuits, and of course over here in America, biscuits mean uh, something different. They they mean like a like a nice flaky pastry. Is that kind of a? Is, is that right? I didn't I didn't realize they. I, you I didn't know they, that. No, I knew. Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because the cookie monster on on, um, on Sesame Street, but I didn't realize right. there was actually. No, no. So if you biscuit. yeah, if you look up like an American biscuit, it's it's like a it's 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 a bread stuff. It's it, right. it's like a breakfast thing, and you can, like biscuits and gravy is like a famous um, American Southern dish. Yeah. You know, so like when I was telling Tom Holland the other day that he needs to become a, a Christian. Um, yeah. Uh, so there, there's a saying, you know, come to the dark side, we have cookies. That's, that's right. sort of the American way of putting it. But yeah. so I adapted it for British ears and said, come to the dark side, Tom, we have biscuits. <laughs> so it's uh -huh. like, so did what? Are you actually so speaking to Tom Holland? So we, we email a bit now and then. Wow. Yes. Wow. Um, I, I must say, though, Esther, I don't know if it's the same in America, but church biscuits have a, a particular genre of biscuit um, that, that is very special, um, particularly what's known as the squashed fly biscuit. I don't know uh, if, if Daniel or, or Jamie have ever come across it. It was sort of a, a raisin impregnated kind of um, uh, uh, fair thing. Uh, um, is that, are you talking about a Garibaldi, Tom? Might be, might be. Yeah. I think it's called a Garibaldi. And they're always a... slightly stale because they sit uh, there. Slightly stale and with raisins. Mm. This is the worst biscuit ever. <laughs> well, um, well, before we go too far down this road, um, and we get, we get more, we got some complaints a few weeks ago. Because we, we spoke about cere breakfast cereals for such a long time. So um, uh, before we make the same error again, um, we want to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who's become a patron of the show. The response has been absolutely overwhelming. We've got now... 99 patrons which is absolutely incredible and i'm just looking at the page now yeah so 99 patrons um absolutely amazing and i do want to give a shout out to some of them but my patreon page has actually crashed so i might not be able to do that but the, the support we've um received on patreon has been amazing and if you'd like to become a patron of the show which basically means that you give us a small amount of financial support and in exchange you get to join our Patreon community, which is a which is a, a wonderful place to be, I can assure you, with lots of like-minded people. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, uh, you can do so for um, as little as three pounds a month, which uh, can buy you approximately two packets of, of chocolate hobnobs. So if, you, if you're willing to forego those those hobnobs, you can join um, our Patreon community, and you just need to go to patreon.com forward slash irreverent and you can join us there and uh, please please do that and as you can see with tom's microphone we are already using this cash to improve the quality of this show and that's just the beginning of the improvements that we are planning for sure um, one of the other improvements or additions if you like um, to uh, the show is we've now started a sister podcast that's right our sister podcast is called a reverend sermon audio and we thought seeing as we're all priests and we're all preaching sermons all the time we might as well record these sermons and put them onto an audio podcast so we're going to be aiming to provide our listeners with a sermon once a week if you'd like to to listen to our preaching if you want to know what our preaching is like uh, you want some uh, spiritual input hopefully spiritual anyway you can go to um, irreverencesermonaudio.buzzsprout.com and you will hear our sermons so you can do that as well yet another addition to the podcast as a result of our patreon community who are financing all of this stuff so thank you very much now i think we need to get to talking to some current affairs as is the um the point of this show if you like um, so what we thought we'd do this week is start out with a new feature called Scripture of the Week, where we talk about a verse from Scripture or some verses from Scripture and how they relate to a particular current event. And I think, Esther, you're going to kick us off this week by sharing something from the Word and talking about a particular current event and how it relates. So take it away. Thank you. So um, for this week's Scripture, I thought it might be apt to do a little reading from Psalm 56. 
And the reason I picked this is because it was the scripture chosen by a pastor in Canada who's been getting a lot of press recently. Um, he pastors a Baptist church called Grace Life, and he spent some time in jail uh, about a, a month or so because his church was refusing to comply with various COVID restrictions. And so naturally this case provoked quite a bit of outcry both within Canada and, and beyond. So um, the congregation is not able to return to worship in the original church building. Um, there's been chain link fe fencing going up around it, strong police presence there. But meanwhile, the congregation has moved to an undisclosed location and uh, started recording their services. So this past week, they put up their first recording. And so this was the psalm that Pastor Coates picked out. And it's sort of apt because it's a psalm of David as he's running away from the Philistines. And I'm going to read from the New International Version. So just about the first half here, of Psalm 56. David writes, Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. So a bit intense, you know, but um, I, I think I think apt, an apt reading. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, how a scripture like that can feel so relevant to something that's going on to a pastor in a church in, in the Western world. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's very shocking. And I've seen some of these, I mean, I haven't followed this case closely, but I've seen some of the, you know, the YouTube clips of, of especially, I, I remember seeing one after they put the chain link fence up around the, the church. And you've got, you know, it looked like 200 policemen all sort of in these kind of, they looked like they were in sort of these bio suits and they were, maybe I'm misremembering that, but they were certainly, they were certainly all wearing masks. And you're just thinking what, you know, what, what on earth is going on here? I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy, isn't it? It, it is crazy. And um, people have been noting that by contrast, the mosques in the area are overflowing. They're, yeah. they're like over capacity and nobody is, is doing anything to stop them. And so there's a, a quite clear contrast there. And yeah. it's, it's the sort of thing you see only, you know, prior to, it's another thing they've imported from the communist China really, isn't it? Who, who are quite fond of uh, chain linking around churches and uh, uh, you know, it's the, the idea that this is okay is, is, um, is, it, is it something, it's probably worse of a disease than COVID on, on the Western sort of consciousness, I should suspect. You know, in, in 10 years' time, we might have forgotten about a, a nasty pandemic, but, but the habits of authoritarianism uh, are much harder to, uh, to shrug off. Um, and I think, uh, well, last week, last week we spoke about the, the Polish church in Canada who, who um, gave the... Um, uh, gave the, uh, the, the sort of Maltese. ultimatum. <laughs> Yeah, and an ultimatum, a short shrift. And, you know, I think, I think some countries are doing much better at remembering, uh, remembering that, um, what it's like to be under totalitarian governments than, than others. And, and uh, so, so I think Germany are really good. I've, always been, I've been very impressed by the number of lockdown protests that have been in Germany, um, sort of large-scale ones, because um, they, remember, they remember what it is like to be under arbitrary government. Um, yeah, we mean, don't. I mean, we don't in in the UK. We we we've we've sold um, we've, we've sold our our gold for a mess of pottage, haven't we? Um, you know, we. Yeah, I mean, this this situation in Canada looks way worse. I mean, we we Esther, I don't know whether you saw the the in our in our in South London here on Good Friday, the police invaded a church and. and I stopped. did. Yeah, yeah I, I thought you might have done. But yeah. I mean, this is this is this is way more extreme, isn't it? I mean, this pastor sent spent a month in prison for essentially conducting but, public Christian worship. And his, but, but, his, but, but, the church are now meeting in an undisclosed location. So it's, it's literally, a, you know, a, a, an underground church that's emerging. Sorry, Tom. I, th I, think, I think, Jamie, that the, the difference is that we haven't had any large denominations be quite so overt in disobeying the COVID regulations. I, you know, what, what, I, we wouldn't be that far off. Like if, if a pastor of, of a large church said, look, I'm just going to open 
in, and they tried that in the middle of last lockdown. I mean, let's be honest, it would have been very similar scenes going on um, from our police and from our government. Uh, there's, uh, there's, no, I don't, there's no doubt in my heart about that. You know, we're not that far away from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 quite it's it's quite um, shocking, isn't it? By the way, um, uh, my my neighbours are having some work done to their patio, and the, the builders are playing very loud music. So I, I'm sorry if it sounds like a, I'm sorry if it sounds like a club in here, but um, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the reality no that I'm living with. Hopefully, this isn't going to violate any kind of copyright. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's, so this Grace Life Church thing, I mean, it is it is crazy. I mean, I think I think you're I think you're right, Tom, that um, that it is it probably would have would have happened here as well. But um, and I guess the other the parallel case was um, was John MacArthur in in the US who refused to refused to close. I don't know what did he do yesterday. He refused to close, didn't he? And he was taken to court, but he wasn't arrested or put in prison. Um, yes, that's right. And and the the city of LA is still trying to to sue. Grace communities. We have to keep our churches with the word grace in the title straight. But yeah. uh, the, the city is still trying to to sue MacArthur, and um, they're, they're they're actually using some documentation that got leaked from a, a private um, email prayer request chain, where it, it was it, it came out that a few members had had tested positive and, and were having some symptoms. So it's really kind of scummy how it all kind of leaked out through this watch blogger and then the city in turn picked up the watch bloggers um, leaked documents mm -hmm. and is now including it in their attempts to sue that church. So it's, it's all very, very creepy. Um, it very, and you know, as, as Tom has been saying, it feels like kind of a throwback to the communist era when it was people informing on each other. It, like that was, that was how, how it worked. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I like verse six in Psalm. It, it could be almost the surveillance capital um, Psalm. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch exactly. every step. Yes, I know. Yeah, very, absolutely. very timely. Surveillance capitalism there in in the Psalms itself. Goodness. Yeah. Although, although maybe I I don't know. Maybe I sh I should sort of interject. I I don't believe that there's literally a tracker in the vaccine like that. Um, no. I no, wouldn't. No. I wouldn't go that far, but we do definitely have a, a surveillance state. Um, do, do, so yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't think Daniel was was saying was saying that, but certainly, like the the the, the increase in surveillance that is going on, uh, and being you know generally uh, our right to privacy is being reduced uh, quite quite dramatically. I think um, at, at the same time as as those areas of, the, of, I mean, in the UK, we're about to have a new bill about. Um, uh, the internet and it's essentially ending the sort of idea that the internet is a um a place of sort of free freedom of speech and ideas um which is quite problematic i think um and uh and they've already they've already passed the police crime and, uh, bill here where where protests have effectively been banned should they wish to ban them um yeah which i they, think is probably they can, be, uh, they can be in prison for 10 years for protesting it's the only number they know, Jamie. We've, you know. <laughs> yeah, as we've established. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think there is a problem with with the state. Well, it's always the problem with the state. It, it likes information. It likes to look at people. It likes to find out things because then it can use it to um, to, to to tax you, basically. I suspect in, in the core, and then so, it's sort of self fulfilling, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But there's, there's been a growth in petty authoritarianism for, for, for years. And I, I, part of me thinks that's part of the reason why this has been shrugged off by the, by the British people who are supposed to be freedom loving. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. they've been trained. They've been trained to be, to be soft. Yeah, we've been softened up, haven't we? I think, I think that's becoming increasingly clear. Um, I got a really interesting email from um, a lady. So she's a, uh, she writes, as a Jewish American woman, I, suppose, I surmise sorry, that I'm hardly your typical listener. Uh, I'm sure you're fairly well informed about our country's response to and recovery from the COVID pandemic. And I try to keep up to date on how the rest of the Anglosphere is doing. My inexpert view is that we in the US are having a better time of it generally, and especially with regard to religious liberty. I attend my synagogue regularly, for which I'm grateful, even if we do have to wear masks and keep our distance. The Catholic churches in my town have been open and holding services for many months, and Catholic schools are holding in-person classes. However, the United Methodists here have voluntarily shut down. 
As you know, however, we have 50 independent states and restrictions vary. To the north of us in Canada, however, things are not so great. And she mentions here um, James Coates. Uh, oddly, I haven't heard much about how the government there is handling other religions. Um, and then she just thanks us for a podcast and so on. But um, I don't know, Esther, is that is that sort of roughly how you see things in, in the US? Are things sort of roughly sort of a little bit better than the way they are in, in the UK? Or, or how are you experiencing things at the moment? I, I think it is, well, it does vary by, by state, uh, as, as she was mentioning there. Um, some of the southern states, like, uh, you know, I can pick out, like, North Carolina, for example, um, has been more open all along. Uh, so it's really up to individual governors. Um, and then in, so in Michigan, you have, actually, Whitmer did, I will give her credit for this, she, she did include a church exemption. Um, even though she was fairly draconian in other respects and came down hard on restaurants, for example, and um, made various decisions that kind of sent the Michigan economy into a, a, a tailspin. But mm. um, yeah, it really is sort of a it's, it's a, it's a widely varying situation on the ground here. Um, and I can talk a little bit beyond the, the church issue. I can, I can talk about some of the frustrations that, uh, that people in Michigan in particular are dealing with, which has to be my state. Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. Okay, so um, I, I think one of the, one of the worst uh, consequences of, of pandemic strictures is how it affects the elderly and mm. people who are living in isolation and care homes. Yeah. Um, because what's, what's been happening is their families ha have been kind of functionally cut off because of the way that the regulations are set up. So um, even though Whitmer does allow visitations, even if uh, case counts are above a certain level. Um, because the care homes are not requiring their staff to get vaccinated, what we have is a kind of a worst of both worlds situation where every single time a staff member tests positive, uh, all visits are frozen for the next two weeks. So even if a resident has been vaccinated, even if the resident's family has been vaccinated, uh, they're not allowed to meet if, if a single staff member has tested positive. And every, every new positive test that comes up, the timer gets reset again. So you could have a family anticipating a visit and then it's almost two weeks and then oh, now, now two more weeks. So it's like this sort of Kafka-esque um, situation that's, that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, I mean, people are just kind of at their wits end. There's, they really kind of have no, no recourse. Um, and so people are dying alone, really, essentially. And then their family members will be told, oh, you can come by any time to pick up this person's effects. But yeah. while the person was alive, they were, they were separated from each other, you know? Yeah. 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 And you shared, you shared with us, didn't you, this anecdote about a woman, I'm reading it here, whose mother died after a long battle with Alzheimer's. Right. Um, so she died, so unable to see a family for 11 months. And then the grown daughter, the grown up daughter was told that she could come and pick her stuff up, stuff up after she died. Right, right. Just, what, I mean, what, you know, what are people, what are people thinking? I mean, what, what inspires that kind of thinking? It's, it's just, it's yeah. an absolute mess. And I mean, so, some of it is government, some of it is bureaucracy. Um, so like individual nursing homes are, are given the freedom to be, not to be more lax, um, but they, they could adapt the regulations to be more strict if they wanted to, and then some of them are. Um, and so it's, it's this, uh, it's, it, it's this, the bureaucratic mentality, really, that, that's just kind of mucking everything up. And it's just the constant, this constant fear, yeah. you know, that the people are living in, where it's like the, the worst possible thing is to, is to have a virus. And it's just this tunnel vision focus on the one factor. And when people say, oh, you're, you're killing people. Um, well, isolation kills people. Yeah. You know, loneliness kills people. Yeah. Um, and I mean, nursing home residents who are depressed are going to be less inclined to do basic things like eat their, eat their lunch, you know, yeah. um, and can just decline that way, yeah. even if they don't have a virus. And so, it's just awful. Folks, yeah. did you see the um, 
probably to Tom and Jamie, uh, the ITN news item last night about the couple in the care home who are reunited after a year. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. I, I just, I, I beg his belief actually that that, um, and yet the way it's presented yeah. seems so anodyne really, you know, completely circumnavigating the, the, the moral right. elephant in the room. You know, Mary, yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's Mary, like this, it's supposed to be this feel good, like, oh, isn't it wonderful? Look at this couple reuniting. It's like, yeah, but it's like horrible that they, yeah. that they were separated for so long and nobody's really acknowledging that. Yeah. Uh, and this is rather creepy bit where the the, the uh, care workers are, are sort of handling them as, it, as, as if they're, yeah, as, as if this is some sort of possibly toxic situation. And a couple of kind of, can we hug now? Are we allowed to? Can oh we? God. Yes, no, can we? And, and oh, 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 thing, oh, oh. Actually, this contravenes so, this must contravene so many breaks in human rights, let alone the theology of marriage, you know, where the two shall become one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. As with all these things, it's, it's never, the assumption is, of course, that, you know, absolutely necessary for them to have been, you know, behind all of these news reports is, is that it's absolutely necessary for them to have been completely isolated from each other for a year. And of course it hasn't been, there's no need for it. There was, there was, you know, it's going right back to the beginning, you know, underneath all of this is an monstrous act of cruelty by our government. Um, yeah. Even if, um, even if you might accept some of the things about lockdown were necessary, was it actually necessary to keep husband and wife apart? What would have happened? You know, were they asked? Were their wishes followed? Probably not. Now, where was their autonomy? Yeah. yeah. Well, except, where, where, where's anyone's autonomy these days? Yeah. I mean, that's a... That's a, that's a, a in the care whole home, home, do you not think in the care home sector, this became very militant. I, I couldn't get my head around this, some of this about, you know, the people trying to kidnap relatives. Yeah out of care homes and you know sort of police runs yeah please change uh, there's one what, yeah it's crazy yes yeah, so, so was it the case that you couldn't if you were in a care home you were essentially in not prison allowed to leave yeah yeah not allowed, I mean, to, not allowed I mean, to discharge yourself I, I know someone who was uh who was actually voluntarily in a care home he's perfectly healthy um and he has a little apartment in a care home it's one of these very posh care homes where they, ha they can have little apartments he, he was locked in there for months he wasn't allowed to leave his own apartment. Now, it's not a self, it's not a self, you know, the, the whole point in the apartment is that it, it's just a room with, with a bathroom, you know. Uh, and he was locked in there, not allowed to go and use any of the facilities of the care home, which he was paying for, presumably. Yeah. Um, and uh, he just, it's, it's just monstrous, isn't it? Yeah. Until last year, it was uncontroversial to say that loneliness was a killer. Uh, and loads of stuff done on that you know loneliness kills people and it and people and even now you know you, i get hundreds of reports of you know i'm feeling a lot slower since covid you know I, i've seen it in my own elderly relatives i've seen it uh um yeah in uh, well they're not too bad you know i've seen it in other people's more actually where actually this has affected their speech their walking that you know i've seen it i've seen it a lot of elderly people in my congregation hmm for sure. Um, you know, one of the things I just, you know, my view on this is just that um, we've, be, the government have absolutely no right to separate a husband and a wife. They've got no sort of natural right to do that. And I think that the problem, the problem is, is that we've lost the capacity to conceive of the idea that the government is not sovereign over every sphere of life. You know, we used to have a more nuanced, I mean, obviously, uh, it depends what time period you're talking about. But, um, you know, it's this idea that the nation state has this kind of absolutist authority is... Um, is it's about 12 it, months old, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, <laughs> I, mean, I suppose it sort of goes back to Thomas Hobbes, but it's not something that we've, we've, we've really agreed to. Um, yeah. You know, we used to have this idea of, of sovereign spheres, you know, that the family was a sovereign sphere. You know, like it's none of this. It's none of the state's business to be coming into my home and telling me, you know, how I should raise my children or, you know, how I should how I should run my household. It's, it's nothing to do with them. It's none of their business. It's the same thing with the church. Like the church is autonomous from the state. It shouldn't. I know we're slightly more complicated in this country because we have an established church. But but essentially, the nation state is its own is its own sphere and it should keep to its own business. And this, you know, this idea that the state can literally tell you to do anything 
is absolutely outrageous. I had somebody today telling me that the, the I mean, I, I'd like to talk a bit about vaccines later. I don't necessarily want to talk about that right now, but he was telling me that the, the, the reason that vaccine passports are important is to um, protect unvaccinated people from one another. So, so I just think that this is like, what kind of planet are you living on? Well, so if somebody says they don't want to take a vaccine, they should be essentially locked in their home uh, in order to protect themselves. For their own safety. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, what, yeah. what's going on? It's daft. You know, it's, well, the idea that we can manage our own risk is gone, Jamie. It's, 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 it's not there anymore. I mean, it, it's just been banished. Um, the... the but it, of course, if we can't manage our own risk, we have no real freedom for anything because just about anything entails a risk. And, and the only person normally who's an expert in the risk that you are prepared to take is you. Uh, no one else. No one else at all. Um, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. I'm just going to um, interject there. One of the most frustrating and sort of discouraging things that I, I hear is christians who, who just kind of mumble along like oh well but the you know the bible says that we need to obey the obey oh. the season and, and, and i want to sort of ask them look even you must have some kind of a limit right like surely you would agree that there would be something the government could say like you know everyone is required to, to stand on one leg for two hours at the crack of dawn on wednesdays and rainy fridays or whatever right like you know if the government handed down something absolutely preposterous like that, surely you would agree that Christians weren't obligated as a church body to obey it. So we just have a disagreement on the substance of what counts as a preposterous regulation. Yeah. Here, but it's know? not even it's not even preposterous regulations. I mean, you know, I mean the argument that we you know, it's Romans thirteen, isn't it, that we, we should be subject to our to our authorities in all ways it makes no sense if you think about it in, in terms of actually the real world. So I mean to the to the point at which, you know, does that mean the church should have stood uh, on the side of the government when uh, all of the sort of civil disobedience around in America, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the um, Martin Luther King and, and the sort of racial segregation. Should yeah. the church have said, well, the government says that that should be fine. So therefore, you know, come on, guys, what are you doing? What are you doing complaining about this? Or should the church have, you know, when the suffragettes in England were, were, were agitating for rights of women to vote, should the church have said, look, uh, actually, the government are the authority here. Um, you know, just just sit down. Uh, you know, or, or should, you know, should the church have colluded with the Nazis and, and so on? Well, I, mean, I mean, you don't even need to go that far, do you? I mean, I, well, I don't. Yeah. So what you're not saying, Tom, you're not saying that um, Paul is making a mistake in Romans 13. There has no. to be some kind of there has to be some kind of um, application of that passage, doesn't it? In, in, I, I, in, God, in godly yeah. matters, when 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 God and ch mm -hmm. I mean, I think he's probably we had a chat about this. And I think, Daniel, you were quite right. And he's saying, you know, in, in general, uh, obeying the law, being good citizens is, is important. Yeah, it's kind of common sense, isn't it? Uh, really, you know, it's really clear what he's talking about. Don't it's bring saying, disrepute. Don't drag a baseball bat round your neighbour yeah, just because yeah. you don't like them, you know, and don't don't loot, steal, and, and well, you don't take a horse and chariot at high <laughs> speed to the yeah, street it, just for the hell of it. You know, he's saying, it, be a good citizen. Well, Paul is also writing in a context when, uh, you know, this, certain factions of Jewish zealots um, would have liked to organize a kind of an armed revolt uh, yeah. against the Romans. So he's saying, <clears throat> no, the Christians, we're, we're not going to do that. We're going to live peaceably with all men and just congregate and worship and serve the poor and that sort of thing. And if they persecute us, then we, we allow the chips to fall where they may. Um, but yeah, go on. I, th I know I think that's absolutely right and I think part of what Paul is saying is about accepting punishment should the state decide to punish you because because I mean Jesus says that the state will punish us and that when when that happens the spirit will will be with us to give us the words to say and, and that act being uh, you know will will be a, an act of witness um, so that's part of it and I think Paul took the uh, the lashings and the punishments of the state even if he uh, continued doing what what brought those lashings upon him didn't he which was um, yeah. spreading a, a new religion yeah but well, of course there's, sorry Tom sorry you there's, can't, also, there's also Daniel of course um, and it's very hard to square the, the whole the whole story of the first seven chapters of Daniel with with Daniel repeatedly refusing the um, strictures of the Babylonian state uh, and being punished uh, and God saving him uh, with with the sort of uh, a um, an absolutist view of we must follow the state in every way because yeah. um, otherwise Daniel becomes a bad man and he clearly isn't um, yeah. is it, 
Well, I mean, the, this was, um, uh, as we discussed during the week, um, I, was, um, I was castigated on Twitter for not taking a particularly um, straightforward view on, on Romans 13 this week and uh, told that I wasn't a Christian or an Anglican or, or indeed a Catholic for, for, um, for saying this. But, but the fact is, is that the Apostle Paul himself, who wrote those words, didn't always obey the authorities. In fact, he frequently disobeyed them. Um, so, you know, I don't think you, I don't think this idea that, you know, you can just quote Romans 13 and that's the end of the, the story. I just think it's, it's, you know, it's manifestly foolish to, to do that. And, um, you know, you have to have some other kind of way of interpreting what Paul is saying. And I think I agree with everything that's been said. I just, I think the thing I would add is that, um, Paul has this very strong idea that God places the rulers in authority in order to bring justice and, um, order to society and so on and so that that raises the question of well, what happens when the when the when the government start to do things which uh, mitigate against the purposes of God and against the well-being of the of the people who they govern you know what what do you then do and I think it's it's manifestly obvious that there are times when you are obliged as a Christian to disobey the government and even to thwart their purposes i mean I, I keep on mentioning every week i've been men reading this book about about dietrich bonhoeffer recently and would anyone would anyone really dispute that bonhoeffer had some kind of moral obligation to do something about what the nazis were doing and just quote quote romans 30 oh you know romans 30 oh yeah it doesn't matter that that, that hitler is massacring all the all the jews and killing all the disabled children you know yeah, yeah romans exactly. 13. Yeah. Right, right. And I mean, I think I think also some people are just it's have a very wooden kind of rigid sense of this where the, the only possible category in their mind uh, for something that Christians should defy would be like, well, I guess if the government literally uh, put out a law saying that you had to, uh, you know, do something blasphemous, we would have to disobey that. Um, but then they have no category for things that are just like frivolous and uh, and harmful. Um, and, and ridiculous yeah. and but then you know the, the issue is that then you just kind of come up against this the substantive disagreement that these people will say well I don't think it's it's frivolous or ridiculous to force everyone to wear masks and keep six foot distance that's only reasonable in time of a pandemic and so it's like well okay then we just don't have anything to say to each other anymore because we disagree you know that's that yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. yeah, once you've accepted there's, there's, a, there's a, some sort of limitation to Romans 13, it's just about finding out where that, where, where that line is drawn and everyone can draw that in a different place, but it's not wrong. It's not un-Christian and it's not un-Catholic or un-Anglican to draw that in a particular place. And I think, uh, I think those words were very foolish. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But, but he did also make it clear, uh, this, this cleric on Twitter, that he'd never heard of the podcast, so he won't be listening. So um so it no no harm done um should we should we um this is this is a fascinating discussion i i really want to talk a little bit about some of the some of the news this week um and particularly i'm, I'm interested to talk a, a little bit about what's going on with vaccines and so on and, and definitely to get your take on it uh, esther mm -hmm. but i think i think we should i think we should um start by just talking about these bizarre comments from our prime minister on on monday um, now, I, as always, I didn't listen to, didn't, <laughs> I don't listen to anything our government says anymore because I find it so depressing and, and, um, and awful. But uh, apparently, uh, Boris has now said that the vaccines, what, what is he, he's he been saying that the vaccines basically aren't the things that are driving down our COVID infections and stopping people from dying. It's the lockdowns. The lockdowns. Right. It's so, I mean, chaps, I've got no, I, I just can't understand why, why he's saying this. I mean, Esther, feel free to chip in as well. But what's, what's going on here? Why is Boris saying, saying this? I think it's because he's perceiving that the, the people are chafing at the bit of lockdowns. Uh, and uh, perhaps um, also there's, a little, there's been a little bit more questioning about the necessity of the continued um, restrictions in the press and in, uh, in Parliament. Uh, and he he needs his his whole credibility is is bound up uh, in in lockdowns being the only thing that was stopping us as a society from falling apart, um, from suffering enormous and un, uh, unmitigable damage um, is is the lockdown. He, his his credibility and his government is bound up in that statement. Of course, the fact that uh, across the world there are various examples to show us that's not true, it, it's just ignored. You know, they're not they're not talked about. Um, uh, because because to, to to engage with why you know um, 
Florida isn't in some sort of apocalypse or what hasn't been destroyed in the last three weeks uh, is to engage with um, the, the, the possibility that, that, that actually they're in lockdowns uh, is wrong. Um, I can't help but being a little conspiratorial um, at times on some of this and think that this also lays path to um, governments to use the variant as you know, future excuses for further lockdowns. Yeah, they're softening us. What have you, you know, that, that it, 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 does it potentially mean that the enabling act will be extended beyond, uh, it's supposed to end, I think, in September? You know, will that, will those emergency powers be forever pushed forward yeah, so there's, uh, there's always i mean because there's some some of the other sage advisors are talking about you know how this new there's an outbreak of the of the which one is it um south african variant mm. uh in in part of london uh and uh they're they're testing everyone left right and center um and um and one of the one of the professors of sage was, was saying oh well we need to re reverse our irreversible path out of lockdown and you know go back into lockdown to prevent this we might have to and you think well if we're going to be chasing variants uh then the, and, and each time presumably have to wait for another round of vaccinations which we know takes months uh back into you know to, to protect the population we, we're, we're never going to get out of this you know the, the logic behind that is literally constantly waiting for another vaccine in which time another variant comes along uh, the, the logic is zero COVID and they've all claimed not to be following zero COVID, uh, but, but in, because it's practically impossible, uh, you know, yeah. uh, but um, without, without shutting down the world um, for, 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 you know, and causing unimaginable amounts of harm. Here's a quote from Jonathan Pajon, uh, who um, runs the Symbolic World uh, podcast, YouTube page, uh, orthodox thinker, very, very sort of popular Christian apologist, uh, very thoughtful individual, and uh, not, not the sort of average sort of, you know, he's not, he's not your black pill person in terms of temperament, but he says that media and government, this is, he tweeted this yesterday, stupid conspiracy theorists saying authorities will use COVID as an excuse to chip you. 10 minutes later, we are going to chip you with a transmitter because of COVID. CBS News military expert says, yeah. and and I watched, I actually read the uh, read, read the piece from, on CBS and yeah, yeah it's uh, this expert in the military in, in medical medical warfare and whatever saying yeah, is, we should chip everybody, yeah. uh, and CBS going well that just sounds amazing, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and, and everybody's oh yeah, that'd be nice. You could have a chip, and you could just you know you could put your wrist. On some devices, you go into the shop and it'll, and it'll tell you whether you've had the upgrade or not. You know, anything. yeah. Presumably, I mean, Mac Hancock will deny it tomorrow, and then uh, Michael Gove yeah. will bring it in in May. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> well, uh, this is, I mean, this is an important point, isn't it? Because, um, and I, I'd be interested to ask Esther about this because, you know, for my money, and uh, you know, this was, uh, I think, our last week's podcast was a was a particularly good um, example of this. Um, well, I don't know about particularly good, but it was an example of this. I think we've just totally and utterly lost trust in the government. Not only do we sort of think what they're saying is wrong, but we, I mean, I, I think anyway that they're just lying. And I've got, this is part of the reason I don't ever listen to Johnson or Hancock, because I, I just think they're liars and I think they're trying to manipulate us. And I, I, I've got, I absolutely disbelieve that this has anything to do with, with science now when they come out with stuff like this. So, um, and I, I guess you guys, I guess you're sort of similar to me. I'm not saying you're as extreme as I am, but um, I just, I, I guess I want to ask Esther, you know, where, where are you at with, with this? I mean, what, what do you, is this the same in your country? You know, you, you sent us a couple of interesting links about Fauci and, and what he's doing, but is, is it the same in your country? Are people, are people, you know, are people sort of to getting to the stage that I've just described where, you know, we just, we just, we just feel that we're being manipulated and, and lied to or what? What's your take on it, Esther? Yeah, definitely. Um, and so they're at National Review, they've, they've had a couple good articles on, on Fauci just kind of shifting the goalposts. And I mean, one of the most blatant things was when earlier he was talking about um, herd immunity and he was throwing out these numbers like, well, you know, like 60 to 75%, but then later 
came out, oh, I actually, did I say 60 to 75? Well, really, I, th I think it's 80%, but I just didn't think that people were ready to uh, hear what I really thought. It's like, oh, so you lied. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you know, fantastic. Or, and, and you know, um, the messaging has just been disastrous around, around the vaccine. It, instead of telling a fearful public, yeah, get the vaccine and then get on with your normal life, it's, well, I mean, you can get the vaccine, but you, I mean, I'm still, Fauci's saying, I'm still not going to go to restaurants. I'm still not going to take trips or whatever, whatever. Thinking, no, that's like, you're, that, you're, you're just like all the, all the anti-vax, uh, you know, s sorts are now have kind of fuel for the fire because they could yeah. point to this and go, see, I mean, it's not even, it's, it's not even working or... It's yeah, yeah, go on. It's exactly the same here. In, in, November, it's, it's in December, it was all, uh, you know, the vaccine is the cavalry coming over the hill, Boris Johnson said, you know, uh, we, we're going to see the end of this, the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, the vaccine was the Messiah, Tom. It's the vaccine was the Messiah, Messiah. it was the hope. And, <laughs> yeah. then, and, then, and then suddenly you get there and the vaccine, I mean, seems to work. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think that's fair to say it seems to be effective. And, uh, and um, suddenly oh well actually it's not it's not the way out of this um at all uh but the problem is there's no other way out the government haven't got a way out of, of of the cycle um so quite what they think they're doing by rowing back on these things it's 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 just demoralizing madness yeah. but i don't know if you yeah i don't know if you were following but um they paused the distribution of the johnson johnson vaccine mm. um earlier in the week because they had a little handful of um blood clotting cases um, out of out of millions successful and so I mean it was just this sort of weird thing I guess you could say it was like an overabundance of caution um, they they paused it but then it's just it creating more of a mess especially for a lot of countries for example African countries where that vaccine was the only vaccine that they had access to at all yeah. So now it's it's just a, it's just a right mess. But it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I mean, it's clear that there are. I mean, all vaccines, or at least all medicines, have side effects, don't they? And we've spoken about this before. And even if 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 the, and I'm certain that the the the, the prospects of a bad side effect from these vaccines is is of, of that sort of magnitude of, of sort of death and dying from it is, is minuscule. But then again, so is the risk to a healthy twenty year old from COVID. And and there's a kind of uh, there's a risk balance you know that, that needs to be taken there there's an honesty about it that needs to be there you know it might be a no it might be a dead cert that a 60 year old would take it based on the risk balances but not uh you know not a 25 year old and i think that's reasonable well um, i mean i, I mean I, I have i do have a slightly different take on this tom and um i don't I, I just don't see how you can say that the risk of these vaccines is absolutely minuscule when we don't know what the what the medium and long term uh, risks of them are i mean i can understand i can understand you saying that in terms of short term risks but i was talking about this on um i was interviewed on time radio times radio yesterday morning and uh, you know i mean it might be the case that only a handful of people have died um through taking the AstraZeneca vaccine and, and so far well as of yesterday morning we knew only one woman who was between 18 to 45 has died as a result of taking the Johnson and Johnson vaccine but um, <clears throat> the the fact is is that um, that woman probably didn't need to take that vaccine because she was um, she was in an age group and 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 probably in, in a, um, a stage of health where she she wasn't at any risk whatsoever from the COVID vaccine uh, sorry, from the COVID virus, and uh, this, uh, you know, this constant propaganda uh, around around vaccines made made her take it. Um, so, you know, you can say, well, it's a statistical um, minority or something like that, but it's still, you know, it's still somebody's life that's ended uh, because she's 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 believed what she's been told, and and she's done something that she didn't need to do. I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think that's a fair comment? Yeah, I, I mean, I, it is a fair comment. It's it's. It's definitely a, a really tragic thing. Um, I myself, I, I waited a bit to to get the vaccine because I, I kind of wanted to see statistically how things were shaking out. And, and then actually just so happens yesterday, I got my first shot of the Pfizer vaccine um, and I, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, I don't seem to have any ill effects, but I feel I feel that frustration with you, Jamie. I understand exactly what, what you're saying. There's like, damn, you know, like she really, it seems like a, a, an un, a completely unnecessary death, like like just a, a complete waste, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, I think particularly uh, when we're talking about, you know, these these vaccines being trialed on children, I just think that, you know, I, I can't understand why. And this 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 I think this um, plays into this conversation about coercion and, and vaccine passports. I can't understand why there's this obsession with having everyone vaccinated, including people who are not at risk from the virus. Uh, or who are at a minuscule risk and including children who are not risk at all uh, from this virus. Um, you know, what, what, what is this obsession with having everybody vaccinated? And this is why I don't, this is part of the reason at least, why I don't believe that this is just about, um, you know, purely protecting people from COVID. Because if it was just about protecting people from COVID, what, what you would have done is had something like um, the, the vaccines being offered to people who are say 70 and above, and people who had underlying health conditions, the kind of people, the demographic of people who have been affected by COVID, you wouldn't have every single person being coerced and propagandized into, into taking a vaccine, which they may very well not need. So this is this. Yeah, I, I suppose the answer, I suppose the answer to that would be, you know, sort of playing, playing devil's advocate, yeah, so sure, to speak. Sure. I guess the answer would be, um, we want to reduce the instances of a gathering between unvaccinated people because that increases spread so that's kind of the rationale that that's the same rationale as with the um the covid passports and that kind of thing so um i mean it's it's a, it's the similar rationale to all the various restaurant restrictions and whatnot yeah it's, for sure but, but if, but once if you've, vaccine, sorry jamie if, on, if, on, if the vaccine works though i mean that's the, the point that i think jamie's about to make if it works then it's already prevented the deaths in those people who are likely to die from it and and we don't we don't treat other once that once that's happened the risk profile of covid has changed and the weird thing is the government is is acting as if the risk profile of covid is unchanged um whereas actually we know that once you strip out 99 percent of the deaths it's not a, you know in the in the rest of the demographics it's not a deadly disease um enough certainly not as deadly when one could almost certainly say as continuing lockdown every day mm. uh, which I, I believe also it, if you vaccinate children you know all children um, not just those who are particular high risk then you're doing it for utilitarian medical benefit yeah um well because the vaccine for them is always yeah, yeah which is coercive and i think israel has talked about giving like a a reward points or something to children who get vaccinated um, that um, you then end up in a sort of this moral minefield where you know you're doing something incredibly dubious it, it, you're, you're, you're using children to create herd immunity it's not that isn't the, the medicine isn't for their benefit it's for the benefit of the wider group I think I think that actually contravenes one of the United Nations charters on medical and meds administration of medicine post Nuremberg, uh, um, etc. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure it does. And, and the problem is, you know, again, there'll be side of even if the side effects aren't deadly to the vaccine, it's, we, we don't tend to in medicine give people medicine that makes them worse uh, to cure them from a, a condition that wouldn't affect them. And mm. th th in children, I mean, it's particularly the case that they don't seem to be badly affected. Thankfully, thank God, they're not badly affected by COVID. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and I, I think that the, what Daniel is saying is exactly right. And I think it, it, it plays into this, um, this, uh, this notion that we, we have essentially become a utilitarian society in which uh, people can be used as ends and are not, sorry, people can be used as means and are not treated as ends. And I think that that is particularly um, pernicious and nefarious when it comes to, to the way that children are, um, are being, well, they're not being treated like this yet, although some of them are being experimented on, but, but they could be used in, in the future. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's horrendous personally, um, the, the prospect of vaccinating millions of children with, with a vaccine which could have side effects, even for one of them, even if you kill one child. Uh, to achieve herd immunity, it reminds me of um, it reminds me of um, the brothers Karamazov when I think it's um, I think it's Ivan who talks about the way who asks the godly character Aloysia, you know, are the tears of one child worth worth the the paradise that God might create out of all the suffering 
uh, in the world? And Aloysius can't bring himself to answer yes. I mean, it's, it's like that kind of thing. You, you, you know, if you sacrifice one child, you, you're beyond the pale. You know, it's, it's completely unacceptable. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's talk about this, this vaccine passport thing. So, um, Esther, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but we've been, um, we've been involved in uh, writing a, a letter to our prime minister, um, which has now been signed by, uh, I think it's over 1,100 uh, Christian mm. leaders and leaders of Christian organizations. And basically, we're, we're expressing um, our objection to the idea of vaccine passports and um, especially, uh, especially highlighting the, um, the fact that none of us would be willing to turn people away from our, from our churches. Um, 11, oh, Daniel's just put it on notes, 1,151 Christian leaders have signed this. Um, so uh, we've, got, we've uh, sent it to all MPs as well, and we've got some really good, um, we got some really good responses. Desmond Swain responds to us. Steve Baker, who's, who's leading the revolt against this in Parliament, sent us a really, really encouraging email and uh, got his PR guy to help us publicise it. So it's been a, it's been a real, it's been, it's been really good, the response. Sorry, Esther, did you want to come in? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I just, I, I agree. Glad that you're, you're doing that. So that's like um, an, an interdenominational thing. You're, you're gathering mm. Protestant, Catholic, whatever yeah. signatures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So all the, the, all the, the principal signatories were, um, were either Anglican or, or Protestant, but we have had lots of Roman Catholics sign it. Um, we haven't had... Um, be, you, sorry, Jeremy, you'd be pleased to know that the, the deacon of the lo local Roman Catholic Church sent me an email containing a link to, 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 to the uh, statement okay. just this morning. So uh, there we are. Yeah, I got one in the irreverend inbox as well saying, you know, I think you should see as a Christian leader, I think you should seriously consider signing this letter. Um, so I was, I was really, I was really pleased with that. Um, so are, collecting, we, are you still collecting new signatures? Or? Yeah, yeah the, 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 the letter is still open. It's been sent to the PM and to all MPs, but it's still open at vaccinepassportletter.wordpress.com if anyone would still like to sign it. Um, so yeah, so it's going to, we'll leave it open for a little bit and see if, see if people want to continue uh, to sign it, but it, I mean, it has been um, it's been very interesting. I, I, one of my one of my reflections is that I think people who are in any way associated with the establishment have 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 not have not signed it. Um, we've not had any bishops from the Anglican Church sign it at all, and and no real sort of. I mean, look, I don't mean this in a pejorative way because in in some ways I sort of think that this is a this is a more biblical way uh, when when God when God does something good in the world that he uses people who might not necessarily be well known or, or well thought of but we don't have we don't have many big names on the list they're all you know people like uh, you know Sunday school teachers or you know pastors of, of, of small congregations or whatever it might be you mean um, Justin Welby isn't rushing out to sign uh, it I'm shocked yeah. shocked yeah. No, Justin, Justin we haven't heard anything from Justin which is which is which is a big surprise as you might imagine but you know God, it's, it's like you know 1 Corinthians 1 you know God has chosen the foolish things of the world uh, to shame the wise he's chosen the, the weak things of the world to shame, shame the strong and uh, you know that's kind of the way I feel about about this about this um, letter um, I wanted to share this and I think let's let's go for some technology here and see if this works but this is one of the reasons I think that this is such an important uh, issue so I'm just going to do a, a screen share for people who are watching on YouTube and hopefully this will this will work oh no this no. is oh. This yeah. is Edwina Curry. Yeah, I think you should put a health warning and tell viewers to what you know. For those of you who are so health, squeamish to look away health. at this moment. Yeah, I mean, this is this is horrendous. So, so let's <laughs> um, let's let's play this for our listeners. But I think this is I think uh, this is awful and this is comical. But you know, do, do you want to tell our listeners who Edwina Curry is? Well, for those, you probably, for those you probably know know more than me about who who Edwina Curry is, Daniel. She Trump. was. I don't the, know who Edwina Curry she is. She was so the health know. minister during the nineteen eighties. Yeah. Um, something of an eccentric figure who became a bit of a TV celebrity in the in the nineties. Afterwards, um, there there are more facts about Edwina Curry yeah. that you can find out that um, I don't really want to repeat. No. Yeah. Well, as you're as you're about to as you're about to witness, um, you know, she's a pretty unpleasant person. But let's let's listen to what she said on uh, on ITV uh, on a on a breakfast show uh, this week. Here we go somebody exercising their freedom not to have a vaccine and they're perfectly healthy. I don't want them sitting next to me in the theatre. I don't want them standing next to me at the theatre bar. I don't want them next to me or anywhere near me or even in the same carriage on the train. So uh, yeah, they can exercise their freedom by staying at home. But millions and millions of us, you know, 
15 million pensioners. We can't wait to get up. You know what the main side effect is of being vaccinated, don't you? And that's itchy feet. And we're going to go out there, and I think there's an obligation on government to try and keep us as safe as possible. We are the majority. Okay, so I mean that's somebody exercising their freedom Sorry. not to have a vaccine. I need to, uh, healthy, it's just repeating again. The there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, gremlins in the system. Uh, yeah, so. There's a level in hell in Dante that has that, will have that on a loop. <laughs> Do you know what? I mean, let's, let's go further. I mean, let's pick an island and send all the unvaccinated there, I think, you know. I, I love it when she says they can exercise their freedom by staying at home. I yeah, mean, I know. That's it's a great. Well, in level of paradox, isn't it? Um, yeah. But of I course, mean, I mean, let's be honest, we know that the vaccines, you know, for, for all that they do seem to prevent um, uh, symptomatic illness and, and severe symptomatic illness in particular, they, they don't stop transmission. Um, so she, she's, you know, so I think someone pointed out, you know, why would um, the, the risk of, if it, if it for example, reduce, reduced transmission to a fifth of, of, of an unvaccinated person, which is about what some of these studies are showing, um, the risk of being with an unvaccinated person to, to Edwina Curry is, is the equivalent of being with five other uh, vaccinated people yeah of course yeah. so i mean what, what what she's really saying it makes no sense at all i mean we're stuck then in a in a world of rule of six aren't we i mean is that is that what she wants with her itchy feet well uh, um, you know. I, I think also you know i mean she, there are a number of things which i think you could pick up on there um i mean one thing i would say is that there are some pensioners who don't want to be vaccinated right so she's talking about 15 million pensioners but what about the ones um, you know, a very close family member of mine, for example, doesn't want to be vaccinated and she's a pensioner. So she should just be locked in her house for the rest of her life so that Edwina Curry could go to the theatre. I mean, it's, it's, it's so obnoxious. But, but the, um, the, the, the thing I wanted to talk about sort of from a, a theological perspective is, is how, and this, this relates to what we're saying in our, in our letter as well, is that the reason that, this is, the reason that this is important is that the church is a community that is is founded, is created, if you like, by, by the incarnation, right? That's why it's, it's, it's referred to in, in the New Testament as the body of Christ. And, you know, I'm particularly reminded of, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but the, in um, the second chapter of the book of Ephesians, the way that Paul talks about the way that Christ has broken down the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile in order to create one new man or one new person you know, so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and recon reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross and so on and, and so forth. And so, you know, the idea, I mean, th and this, this sort of perfectly encapsulates it, that how divisive this, this, whole, this whole idea is. It is, it is literally, a, 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 well, an attempt on the part of Edwina Curry to, to suggest some kind of apartheid in, in society where, there, where groups of people are separated from one another. And one of, one of the points we wanted to make emphatically in, in this letter is that that would, be, that would be an absolute betrayal of the gospel and of what the church is, of the church's identity, if we were to allow that to happen, because, because the nature of the gospel is that, that it creates one body out of disparate people who were divided and hostile towards one another. And this is one of the reasons that the church is so is so dangerous to totalitarian regimes, because what they want is they want to accrue absolute loyalty from everyone. And they can't they can't abide this idea that the church might might um, might be a focus for, for, for a different type of loyalty. And I think you can see how 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 just how unpleasant and obnoxious this is when when somebody like Edwina Curry is, is brazen enough to to say I don't want them near me you know it's, yeah it's, yeah she's like a character out of the great divorce or something I think she's, 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 she was like Dolores Umbridge that's, that's right yeah I, I can imagine <laughs> people at home having to magically write on their wrists stay safe <laughs> Wash yeah, yeah. hands. Scratch into oh, their hands. Putting blood into their skin. But, <laughs> you know Jamie, to, to your point, I, I, I just want to kind of add something to that. That this was um, an excellent point that I saw somebody make on socials a while ago. Is you know, if you think back in the in biblical times, uh, when life was just so much riskier, and I mean, we had we had no vaccines for anything. You know, people could a thirty year old could catch pneumonia and die. Um, and yet it was precisely in this context, and then even um, before the founding of the church, in the context of Judaism, 
that God explicitly instituted, you know, what you might call super spreader events where mm-hmm. people would gather um, in one place to, to celebrate feasts and, yeah. and whatnot. Um, and, you know, apparently he seemed to prioritize the gathering together of people from different nations uh, to worship him over and above uh, you know any of the numerous illnesses at that time that people could have caught and died from yeah, yeah absolutely I mean, mm. I mean to be honest if, we, if we're looking at sort of absolute risks I mean I, I did some calculations back in uh, August um, which looked at um, Neil Ferguson's predictions and, and the, you know the worst case scenario that the government panicked over and I, I worked out that it was something like um, take us back to the absolute risk levels uh, for all age groups of uh, about 1976. Yeah. Uh, so living, uh, living in a world in which we haven't locked down and Neil Ferguson's worst case scenario had come to pass, we would be living with the risk to mortality of everyone uh, being 1976. Now, I, the last I checked about 1976, they did not, uh, you know, I mean, yes, it was a lot worse even before, but, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, that we can't meet, that we can't act, we can't, we can't be human, uh, to, to avoid a risk level of 1976 becomes becomes absurd, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's yeah. let alone the sort of levels of biblical risk that that um, that were there with, with you know, yeah. without any me- modern medicine. Yeah, I mean, I think well, more that, people sorry more people died in 1976. Of, uh, I imagine heat stroke because it was the the summer of 76. Yeah, but, uh, uh, this is the pernicious ideology, isn't it, of safety? We've had it in wokeism where it's safe spaces and safe speech. Mm. And now it's transmuted over into a sort of material healthcare safety. Yeah. Um, I think it was, I might mention it before, isn't it? C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man mentions that the worst kind of tyranny is where... Uh, it's, it's not, yes, he'd rather live under the tyranny of the robber baron is this yes. the one you're talking about? Yeah, the famous quote: "He'd rather be under a robber baron whose whose malice might sleep; he might be sated, than under the uh, than than under the uh, the public health." Or he didn't call it public health; he called <laughs> it you know the technocrat. <laughs> technocrat. <laughs> Matt, Matt uh, on. <laughs> because because they're, they're because the the oppression that they bring is is not satable because it's it's constantly seeking uh, mm-hmm. for the greater good. Um, you know, they couldn't sleep because to sleep would be to would be to harm people. But what they're actually doing is, is harming people. Yes. You know, that's why I, I personally, you know, if this keeps going on, like go and live in Egypt or something where the state at least, you know, it's, it's a horrible state. Uh, there are policemen everywhere, but they can't they can't have this level of control over people's lives because it would just be impossible. There are too many people in Cairo alone. You know, you or, could live or, a free or, life there. Or so Russia. Or, Russia's or, more free than we are at the moment. Italy. Italy's, Italy's good because they've got a terribly functioning government, but it's a beautiful yeah. country. So I'd go for Italy over, over, over Egypt. Probably. I like Egypt. I like sure Egypt a lot. nice as well. I'm sure Egypt is nice as well. I've it's never a, been there. I know you've been a, it's a wonderful place, Jamie. Um, yeah, yeah, well, no, I'm not. I'm not, not dissing Egypt. All right. <laughs> if, we've any, if we've got any listeners from Egypt, I'm not dissing it. I just really like Italy. I like the food. Talk, talking of Italy, we, we can we can swage into into Prince Philip quotes, can't we? Because Ooh. Prince Philip had something to say about Italy, um, didn't yeah. he? I think we should. I think we should uh, pay tribute to Prince Philip for the last few minutes. I think you're quite right. right. Um, uh, yeah, sadly um, passed away after a very long and, and quite incredible life on on Friday last week. I think it was. So. Um, yeah, no, Tom, tell us, tell well, us. I know, I think it's Esther's favorite quote, isn't it, on your Twitter? Uh... Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so I, oh, there's so many. I, I, I don't know. Daniel had a different oh, favorite yeah, quote, yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, it's like we're going back and forth. And, I, and maybe Daniel's favorite quote really is the best. But, but one that I was leaning towards um, was when he was at a dinner in Rome and the prime minister was plying him with the finest Italian wines. And he goes, get me a beer. I don't care what kind, just get me a beer. <laughs> so I, I loved that one. But then, Daniel, what was your favorite? Uh, it, it, it was the sequel the day after. And I remember this as, I, I think I must have been a teenager when this came out and it was a big news item that he'd said about um, something, some electrical, some house where there was some electrical system and he'd said it, it, it looks like it's being built by Indians. Yes. And then the next day he said, actually, I meant to say cowboys. I got my cowboys and Indians mixed up. <laughs> um, 
I, I like, I mean, I picked out one for you. I think this is, this is a good one. Uh, people think there's a rigid class system here, but Dukes have even been known to marry chorus girls. Some have even married Americans. Uh, there we go. There's a, uh, but I mean, I think he speaks quite nicely to the current situation uh, in this one. Fashion is not restricted to clothes. And when ideas become fashionable, they are just as resistant to objective criticism as the length of skirts. That's why all economic ideas need to be freely discussed and judged against the facts of real life. Well, that needs to be sent to Sage, doesn't it? Um, yeah. uh, he, was, he was quite a deep thinker, I think. You know? Yeah, I think so. It was an intelligent man. You don't, you don't become a senior officer in the, in the Royal Navy by being an idiot. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like this one that uh, Esther did on, on Twitter when he said to Jeremy Paxman on his, on his role in, in the Royal Family, any bloody fool can lay a wreath at the thing of me. I think that's really great because, it, you know, it sort of it sort of illustrates how the, how how the, ro the life as a royal must be so strange. You know, you, oh. you really have a role which is kind of unskilled in a sense because you don't know, you don't need to have to sort of develop technical abilities over year, years to do it. But at the same time, you, you you do you know there is a sort of there is a sort of way that you have to pull it off. But essentially, what you have to do is you have to um, have to kind of lay aside your individuality in order to do it. And I thought that that was one of I don't know whether you you will watch the, the Crown, but I thought especially the first two series of the Crown really sort of quite good, yeah. Before it got rubbish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that right, and for Philip in particular, that that as you were saying, Jamie, there's a kind of a poignancy there because he was the prince consort. Yeah. Um, so so he had to lay aside. Um, you know the sort of the crown of career so to speak and it, like that that he had climbed quite high and could have climbed even higher um in this very very highly skilled area but then all of that was subordinated to his duty to the queen um which then he carried off beautifully for well, these many decades and it's, it's a, a marvelous example i think mm. yeah yeah I but there's a couple of ones here on popular culture further on in that spectator list which is just priceless i wish he'd turn the microphone off during elton john's performance variety <laughs> <laughs> show and then the one to um uh kate blanchett when she said she worked in the film industry can you fix my dvd player I mean, uh, that, that it's the sort was of thing we all gold. want to say, isn't it? We all want to say it. I think mm. Peter Hitchin said this a couple of days ago that uh, it's what every common per common sense person thinks, but don't say in the current milieu. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked the one where he was he was at some kind of a cocktail party. And there were these female labor MPs with their name tags reading Ms. And he goes, ah, so this is the feminist corner, I see. <laughs> it's like in the year 2000, when that was definitely considered a bit of a gaffe, but I love it anyway. It's very great. Right. I, th I thought there's one that makes quite a good irreverent tagline, actually, which is, I've never been noticeably reticent about talking about subjects about which I know nothing, <laughs> uh, she said. And, uh, <laughs> and maybe uh, maybe another another rather good political one, which is uh, when he when he when he discovered that Ghana had two hundred uh, members of their parliament, he said that's about the right number. We have six hundred and fifty, and most of them are a complete bloody waste of time. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> which I, this year has proved nothing but that to be. A, uh, it's not wrong, right, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's not wrong. Well, as, as Prince Harry said, he, he was clearly, I think it was Prince Harry anyway, he said he, he was clearly a legend of, of banter, which, um, which, which he certainly was. Um, so, yeah, so we, um, we offer prayers for the royal family and, mm. um, and uh, for, for, indeed, for Prince Philip himself, if you are that way inclined. And, um, and yeah, yeah so um, I think we better wrap things up there because uh, yeah. we're approaching uh, my, my dinner time. Um, so I'm, um, I, I will be, I will be called indoors. Um, but I think we, we should say a huge thank you to Esther for, for coming on and giving us uh, her take from, from across the pond. Um, it's always a pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Always a pleasure for really my part. Lovely, Esther. Really, really nice to have you. And um, if anyone wants to email us, you can send us an email at reverendpod, um, sorry, at reverendpod at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at uh, irreverendpod. And uh, do leave us a review on iTunes or wherever. Uh, it's nice to read those and it helps us to go up uh, in the algorithm when people search and so on. Don't really understand these technical things, but I think it's something like that. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks so much, everybody. Tom, Daniel, Esther, 
thank you so much and uh, look forward to being with everyone again very soon. Thank you. Uh, can I um, close with the words of Prince Philip? Go on. Uh, I declare this thing open, whatever it is, <laughs> while opening a site visit in Canada. Wonderful. Oh, Brilliant. Thanks so much, Daniel. All right. God bless. Bye now.